I want to thank those who are here in their services today and those who are tuned in uh, on a screen. Thank you for being with us. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Perez giving us a sermon on the a sermon will be on Revelation chapter 6, 9 to 11. The sermon will pay tribute to martyrs for the Christian faith. <clears throat> a little reading on that. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Revelation 6, 9 through 10. Well, thank you, Mike. I'm still excited about preaching through Revelation and I'm still nervous, okay? Because I was very tempted last night to have plan B and preach another sermon that I had to uh, preach last night for Pepperdine University has their lectureships and they asked me to go ahead and submit a sermon so I came in here I did a sermon for Pepperdine um, went really good and Liz goes man you should preach that one but then we'd have to skip Revelation chapter 6 I said no got up in the morning early and went for it so we're gonna go for it I'm gonna ask us to bless us um, as I preach this to bless me because it is a little bit nerve-wracking when you're dealing with new stuff amen, amen. and um, dear God bless me bless our church and help this sermon doesn't go together perfect, but help it to just, um, like it says in 2 Timothy, to do our best. Um, and I just pray that you bless me so that I can bless your people and those online too. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So here's how I'd like to begin. An Islamic judge condemned to death a zealous Christian convert from Islam, Medidi Debaj. His only crime? was converting to Christianity. See, De Medidi Debaj had been in prison 10 years, and a copy of his execution order was leaked out from the prison and gotten to the hands of Haik Hosvespian. That's how you say it, Haik Hosvespian. Haik was the leader of the Protestant Christians of Islam, or of Iran. One more time, Haik Hosvespian was the leader of the Protestant Christians of Iran. Haik, risking his life, chose to speak out and launch an international campaign to overturn the sentence of Medidi, Medidi Debaj's death sentence. And he was successful. A few days before his execution, Medidi Debaj was released from prison. Amen? But there was a price to be paid. And I don't want to get too emotional, but I said I would mention, Pike spoke out at the risk of his own life. And on January 16th, 1994, there's a scene in the movie or the documentary, A Cry from Iran. I put it in the bulletin, look it up, it's on Amazon Prime. It was one of those documentaries that just hit me hard in the heart. And you can watch it tonight if you want, but in that scene on January 16th, it shows Meredi Debaj and Haik Hosvespian eating dinner after going to church just like us, or eating a lunch like we do when we go out. And they were so happy. Three days later, Ike disappeared. So I wanted to start off this sermon series, especially as we get into the section that I consider the hardest part of Revelation, the divine judgments, where John gets a revelation of three sets of seven judgments to the churches, to the seven churches. Remember, the seven seals is where we're at right now, chapter 6, verse 1, all the way through chapter 8, verse 5. Those are the seven seals. And then he goes immediately as he opens the seventh seal, he goes into the seven trumpets, which is even stricter or harder judgments, divine judgments. 
And then he gets into like the Christian message retold in chapter 12 and 13. And then he gets into the seven signs and then the seven bowls, which is a revisit of the plagues from Egypt. And as I was sitting in class a few weeks ago and listening to my professor going over these divine judgments, it dawned on me as how do I preach on this stuff? And he allowed us to write questions in, a, in the chat, in the Zoom. And so I wrote, how do I preach this in a church where most of us don't get persecuted like this or don't live in a place in the world where a lot of this stuff that went on in the first century was going on? And it was an interesting response to what the professor told, it, told me, Rick Oster. He said, maybe you can have Martyr Sunday or preach a little sermon series on people of the world that get martyred for their faith. He goes, because that's really the context of chapter 6 and 7 and 8 and to the end that these Christians were being taken advantage of. And he mentioned on a scale, I think I said this a few weeks ago, on a scale of 1 to 10, some of the Christians that were being censored were told, told to repent, like the church in Laodicea or the church in Thyatira or the church in Smyrna, the ones that were compromising a little bit, and he said to censor them. Yes, he was using the world's governments to punish his people, but he only wanted it, God wanted it on a scale of maybe 1 to 5. But the governments and the people and their officials stepped it up a notch and they, they were punishing the Christians about a scale of an eight or nine. And that's why John is writing this book. Because Christians feel that God, in a time such as this, in a time that we're living in, and all this stuff is going on, how long is this gonna continue? Where my brothers and sisters are being persecuted so I couldn't help but think of that story and research some of my own, I guess, some of my own research of people that have been martyred for the faith. So keep in mind the story of Persia, of Hyke, Hosvespian. In chapter six of Revelation, you'll see as we have studied this before, I had mentioned in chapters one through three, John writes to the seven churches. Some he is censors, some he, he actually commends, and he's trying to get them to be more faithful, right? To be faithful witnesses of the gospel. And then in chapter four and five, he sets up the throne that if God is gonna come and have divine judgment over his churches or over the world, that he has to set up that God has the, the right to do it. And if that's chapters four and five. And he sets up the throne with the four living creatures and the 24 elders and God sitting on the throne. That's chapter four. And then guess what happens in chapter five? Remember the line from the tribe of Judah? He opens that, he opens uh, as he's handing in the scroll and he looks and he sees and it's a slaughtered lamb and that's Jesus. So the chapter four and five ends with this phrase in chapters five or five verse 13. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on, under the sea, even sea animals <laughs> worshiping God. And all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne, that's God, the God of heaven and earth, to him who sits on the throne, which is what we're doing right now, and to the lamb. They add the lamb, the slaughtered lamb, which is Jesus. Praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Verse 14, the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down in worship. And that leads us in to chapter 6. And who is worthy to open the scrolls or the seals, not marine animals, okay? Because I was going around in our Bible study, but the seals are these seals that are enclosed in a scroll and the lamb, Jesus, is the only one worthy to open it. So he begins to open the, 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 these uh, seals. And the first four, I'm just gonna give you a little pattern that I think John has in this uh, seals and also in the trumpets. The first four go together. They're the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You may have heard that. 
them. The four horsemen of the apocalypse go together. That's verses 1 through 8. Then there's two that go together that represent the church people, the God's people who are suffering. They go together. That's number 5 and 6. And then there's like an interlude or a diversion or kind of a, you say, chasing a rabbit or an extension of scroll number 6 or seal number 6. And then there's the last one. It stands alone, the seal number 7 in chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, as he opens up the seventh seal. And the only point of the seventh seal is that out of it comes seven trumpets and seven angels. That's the same pattern. This four, this is four plus two, interlude plus one. One more time for those of you that are listening. The pattern here is four plus two. There's an interlude or an extension and then it's plus one. So there's seven of them, and that pattern holds for the seals and for the trumpets. So just keep that in mind. So let me just read from chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, but I want to focus in on, my goal today was to focus in on seal number 5, the martyrs, the Christian martyrs. I watched as the lamb, and notice who's worthy, it's the lamb, it's Jesus. The lamb, I watched as the lamb opened the first seal, first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures. Interesting, one of the four living creatures is the one that summons the horsemen to come. It's not Jesus. Jesus opens the seal or cracks the seal, and it's one of those four living creatures that summons these horsemen to come. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a loud voice like thunder, come, and he summons the horsemen. I looked, and there before me was a white horse, and its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror and bent on conquest. So think about God right now. Is the illusion right now that we live in 2021 and all the problems in the world that we live in, is there the, the illusion that we have been duped to think that God is not on his throne? And that's what's going on in Revelation, that the Christians who are suffering have been duped to believe that Rome and the powers of that day are on the throne and they're more powerful than anyone. And John's peeling back heaven and saying, no, they're not. God's on his throne. And that's why he shows him this sign, that God right now, not back then, but right now in 2021 is doing the same thing and it's carrying on to this day that he's on his throne and these four horsemen of the apocalypse are riding through the earth. And maybe these cherubim are circling our church right now in our presence. We just don't see them and our eyes need to be open to this. So the four living creatures in a loud voice say, Come, and I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature say, Come, and there's the summons again. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace. Think about what's going on in the world. The rider was given power to take peace from earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. And it was interesting, my professor said that this verse is not governments or armies taking over, it's individuals and societies and society that it's causing murder and strife and killings. We're not naive to the fact that that goes on every day in our world. We hear about it in the newspaper, we hear about it in Santa Paula, a gangbanger shot to death, or something goes on, or someone innocent, or even guilty. People are doing this all the time, and this is what has happened. God unleashes this. And these guys, by the way, the four horsemen of the apocalypse is not satanic. Who opens the seal? It's God. It's Jesus. And this comes from the throne. So they're under divine sovereignty and divine authority of God, and they come from God's presence to go into the world. So that's important to understand. The next seal, the third seal, verse 5, when the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales, 
in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages. Do not damage the oil and the wine. And what's wrong with this scene? They're overpricing. They're price gouging. That's what the scene is. It's injustice. And we see that going on. Gas prices going up and people charging too much. And this is happening back in the day. And he's saying, you rich, woe to you rich. If you're part of that and you're turning your head and you're overcharging people, he's saying this, God's going to take care of that. And he knows. So that's what this scenario is about. Then he opens the next seal, the fourth one, verse 7, when the lamb opened the fourth seal. And keep in mind, Hak, Hike, Post Vespian, the people in Iran, and they're in prison. And the, I gave you, I gave passed out maybe about 20 men that are in prison in Iran right now for just doing what we're doing right now. Wonder what they're thinking as they're in their prison cell. Maybe they're reading the book of Revelation as God, I know you're there somewhere. I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. And this is a famous one. You've heard that one, the pale horse. Death. I mean, if you see the movie Tombstone, remember Doc Holliday? <laughs> Val Kilmer, he was always pale. Well, that's what he meant. He was dead. And Johnny Ringo knew it. Great. I mean, if you see that scene, if you watch that movie Tombstone, it was just, he was dead. And Doc Halliday was a bad dude. And he looked like death and he was ready to die. But boy, did he cause judgment. That's where you get this idea, this symbolism from. The pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was falling close behind him. Here's the good news. You see, you skip in the Revelation chapter 21. One of the first things that God does or Jesus does is throw death and Hades into the lake of fire for eternity. Amen? Amen. God has overcome because of Jesus Christ death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? So that's the setup. These four go together to remind God's people that he's on the throne and he's riding through these horses. And this scene is, comes from Zechariah chapter 2 and Zechariah chapter 4. I'm not going to turn there. But if you read that, there's a story in the Old Testament in Zechariah of these horsemen and chariots going out through the earth, doing the same thing and judging the earth. And they have, there's four of them. And they're horses of different colors and they're going out to judge. So John has this in mind. And then you get to the fifth seal. And here's when I, why I wrote about men like Hike was Vespian. This was his obituary, and I hope I don't get emotional. Hike was Vespian Mir disappeared in Tehran on January 19, 1994. Just days after one of his church members, Mehdi Debaj, was freed from prison. The Baj had been sentenced to death on the charge of apostasy simply for converting from Islam to Christianity. That's all he did. That was his crime. For acknowledging that Jesus is my Savior and maybe getting baptized and showing the world that, yes, I do believe in Jesus Christ. That was his crime. And Hike had been instrumental in bringing the Baj's plight to the attention of the world. And I would add, to the attention to God and the Lamb. Amen? Amen? It's sometimes through us, through our actions, that we have to stand and say, you know what, enough's enough. And we have to stand and say our peace, even at the cost of maybe our lives. We live, in America, we live in a free country in America. But there are times where we have to say, that's not right. In Iran, here's the laws considering how you can and can not worship in church or on a Sunday. Here are the five laws. No services were to be held in the language of Persia which is their native tongue. Persia, or Farsi is their kind of dialect too, but they can't speak in Persia. That's one of the things that was told to Christians in Iran today. 
all services have to be held on Sunday. So they do allow services to be held. They can't be in Persia. Only card-holding members of the church, so if you're baptized and you get a baptism certificate, you have to bring that to church to show that you're a member of that church. Only members holding, um, only card holding members of church could come to service. Membership lists, and we keep a little roll call list in the back, right? We're not censoring you. But membership lists in Iran had to be given to the government. They have to turn them in. And new members had to be approved by the government as well. Hike Hosvespian said this about these laws. I and my ministers will never, will never bow down to these demands. And he knew the price to be paid. Amen? That's gutsy. When I saw this documentary, out of the blue, I was just searching for something. You know, when you search and trying to find a movie that you haven't seen, you see all oh, they all look the same. And something just stood out, a cry from Iran, and I just put it on out of the blue in this movie about, and this is the bishop. This is Hike. It was Vespian, a picture of him. And I'm shaking as I show, show you this because it, it just startled me. It's a 54-minute documentary. His sons paid tribute to their father and made this video for him. So I wanted to show you that now we get to the fifth seal. When the Lamb opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, Lord? Notice what they say, how long? It's not a cry for vengeance. It's not a cry for wrath on your enemies to punish them. It's a cry, as I saw this movie, this documentary, as hike. And at his funeral and his wife is there sitting and his little girl and his son I remember the picture of his son he's a maybe 10 12 year old and he looked like he's just in a trance but the little girl the 10 year old maybe 8 to 10 year old little girl is singing as the church is singing their songs and she's singing you there's a seriousness on her face and she's young and think about growing up as a young kid in that situation their father had just been murdered and she's singing in church at their father's funeral and it did, that little scene if you watch the documentary is just hit my heart how long and she's crying and tears are coming down her eyes and she's not crying in sense of like she's crying just almost like justice god how long How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge? And notice what is mentioned by these martyrs. And they're under the altar in this scene room in heaven. How long until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? They're raising that question. How long, God? and avenge our blood. And then notice what God does. Then each of them was given a white robe. To me, this is good news. He was given them a white robe. Amen? We may not be living, and I thought of as I was reading this text today, Gene Fossey. He's given a white robe right now. He may not have lived the life like this or under persecution, but we got to bless him and actually send him back up to heaven. You know, God does that, but you know what? We got to be part of that little funeral service. So each of them was given a white robe and they were told 
here's what God tells these people and maybe the list of these men I've given you, these men in prison in Iran. They were told, wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters were killed just as they had been. I know I wasn't as tight in the sermon as I wanted to be, but my main point is this, that God is in control. And here is why I wanted to bring out why God's in control. He opens the sixth seal. And when he opens the sixth seal, what happens is God's judgment comes upon the earth. And you could see the scene. And I was thinking about this when John wrote this, and I asked Asher this question because a couple years ago, him and Samantha and their family went to Rome and they went to Pompeii. And I asked Asher the other day, hey, Mount Vesuvius erupted and destroyed the city of Pompeii. Do you remember what year it was? And you told me it was in? 79 AD. Probably right about the time that the book of Revelation was written. So when you read this text as he opens the, set, the sixth seal, and I watched, and he opened the sixth seal, and there was an earthquake, and the sun turned black, and the sackcloth made of goat hair, the whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth, and figs, figs dropped from the fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings, and notice there's another heptad here. There's seven leaders, types of leaders mentioned in verse 15, the kings of the earth, the princes, generals, rich, mighty, slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks and the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us. Not saying fall on them and kill them. They wanted them to be surrounded by these rocks so they can escape the wrath of our living God. Fall on us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of the wrath has come and who can stand before it? And I can't preach on because I'll go on to chapter 7 and there'll be another sermon. But chapter 7 is, shows those who stand. It's those who wear the white robe. Those who acknowledge Jesus as their Savior. And there's victory in it. That's the interlude. That is the extension to this. That those are the people that stand. It's you and I that take time to come to church and to acknowledge that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. So, I guess the last thing is, as I was reading this story about Hawk Hesvespian, when uh, Hawk disappeared and the investigation took place by Hawk's family and friends, and courageous brothers and sisters in Christ. And I have to say this, his body was found in a Muslim cemetery buried in a shallow dirt grave. And they went to the police and the police would not fess up that they knew about this. And the way they found Hyde's body is one of the, I guess, undertakers in the cemetery knew about this and he was the one who happened to be Muslim that told the family because they knew Hike loved the people of Tehran and he secretly called the family and told them it was Hike and the reason why he recognized him because on his jacket coat was the symbol of the cross and there's no way that would be in a Muslim cemetery and when they found Hike this is the only graphic I say he was stabbed 26 times, and it's mentioned in the documentary, and in his heart, they stabbed his heart so many times that it looked like he had been stabbed by a chisel. So when you read these stories, you think about the blood of the martyrs. It's the seed of the church. I think of men like this. Help us to be faithful witnesses of the gospel in America. Amen? And may God bless us as we stand and sing a song of invitation.